The subject is a strange one. And one might think it borders on presumption. What is God doing? I couldn't tell you what he's doing now, this very moment. But God leaves remarks for us to know certain things. We want to take a look this morning into this strange topic. And if we can guide our thoughts according to his purpose and plan without being presumptuous, we can find out some things about the great eternal God. <clears throat> I hope you realize that the sermonette was very divine in its similarity to the sermon topic dealing with that great Yahweh. You know, difficult questions we detest. Somebody says, who is God? It's a good question. And then they follow it. Where is God? And those questions are supposed to cause you who are striving to follow God to stumble and fall back and relent. Where is God? They ask us in derision. We say God is everywhere. <laughs> That's not the answer they wanted. Now, in the garden of Eden, you remember the first question? It was asked by the devil. Yeah, your mind goes that far back, doesn't it? He said to Adam, has God said, And Adam and Eve uh, quickly thought, what did he say? He said not to touch the fruit. What did he say? So difficult questions present problems to us. As your child ever ask you, mommy, where did I come from? Questions of science, who am I? What am I doing here? Where am I going? Those questions have baffled mankind and scientists and educators and theologians for <coughs> a very long time. There was a young man in the Bible, his name was Gideon. We sought to name our children by the names, and my first son, his name was Brian Gideon. Second son was Wendell Stephen. <clears throat> Gideon was one day on his father's property, minding his business, and all of a sudden, thinking of what the sermon spoke about, the angel of God appeared to him. And who are you? He said, if there is a God, where be the miracles? His father, Joash, had taught him of God's greatness to Israel and to God's people. And so he said, if there is a God, Where be the miracles that were performed in Egypt? Show me, tell me. Elisha. Remember Elijah? His predecessor. The man who followed him, his name was Elisha. And he was plowing the field one day 
Elijah threw his mantle around him and said, follow me. How can I leave power my oxen and doing my father's work and come and follow you? He followed him as far as he can go. And then they got to a certain place and God was about to remove Elijah as his spokesman and insert Elisha to follow. Elijah said to him, well, if you want to find out why I'm calling you or why I'm trying to indicate to you something is ahead, follow me. He followed Elijah. They came to one town, Jericho, went on to another town and Elisha was getting kind of uh, tired of uh, this protracted journey. And then they got to the Jordan. And Elisha said to Elijah, if you're going someplace, can I have a double portion of your spirit? We're talking about hard questions. Elijah said to him, well, if you see me when God takes me, maybe that can be granted to you. They came to the banks of the river Jordan and Elijah, the elder, took off his other mantle and struck the waters of Jordan and the waters of Jordan were parted. That was spectacular. And as they went on a little further, the whirlwind began whirling and Elijah was caught up in the vortex of this whirlwind and was taken up. The evangelicals say that he went to heaven. We ask which heaven? The heaven of God or the heavens above us? Where the stars and the moon and the other things reside. And Elijah said, my father, my father, the, 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 the hospital of God and the, the, the spirit thereof. And in no time flat, Elijah was gone. And the sons of the prophets who were looking on at these two walking away said to Elijah, would you like us to go and look for Elijah? Where is he? The evangelicals have already concluded that they went to heaven. So he was persuaded, it's ah, all right, go ahead and look at this, see if you find it. Second Kings chapter 2, three, you find that story. They went and they saw one or two days, and they did not find Elijah. They came back to Elijah and said, we didn't find him. He said, didn't I tell you? Where did Elijah go? Your Bible, like mine, contains Second Chronicles chapter 21 and verse 12. It says that a letter came from that same very Elijah to a king. So Elijah did not go into the heaven of heavens and the very presence of God, the Yahweh, at all. Talking about difficult questions. Now, <laughs> the first question of the Bible was what Satan asked and then God said to Adam and Eve Adam where are you? they had already taken the fruit and they had skedaddled off Attempting to do what most people do, hide from God. Adam, where are you? And the various questions in the Bible. But notice the difference in the New Testament. Matthew 2 and 2. Man is now looking for God. And they ask, where is he that is born king of the Jews? 
So we are trying to show that hard questions are not always easy to answer. Of course, they were given the wrong direction. They went to the palace and thought they would find the king of the Jews there. But he was not there. Now, back to our original question. What is God doing? Hard question. What I'd like to do is ask a four question of my first point, which is, has God ever done anything? What has God done? God made the earth. Is that good enough for you? God made the earth and all that in it dwells. Not only has God made the earth, but God has made us. Yeah, God made you. Science tells us why we came from maybe a lower form of creation. An ape, some other animal. No, God fashioned us with his own hands and breathed into Adam the breath of life and man became a living spirit, a living soul. So are you asking, what has God ever done? God made the world. And God made you and I. We have a destiny. God does not make anything or whatever for no reason. And God's plan is that we who have been made by him will one day live with him in eternity. So God created you and me. And we know that you're on the right track in this quest to find out what is God doing? We know that God made the world, actually the worlds, according to Hebrews, and God also made you and me. <coughs> now, how did we get here? Science, scientist, men of thought, have always sought to find out what are we doing here? Where are we going? What's this planet all about? It was this week, week that scientists have finally landed on Mars. What are they looking for? Another hard question. They're trying to show that there must be life out there. But the Bible, God's word to us, only deals with Earth. Though God made all of the planets, God is dealing with the Earth now. So, if we know that to be the case, we should be paying attention to what God says in his word, and what God is doing now. Turn with me to the book of Isaiah, chapter 40. Let's see if we can find out a little more about this question. Isaiah, the Jews are ready this morning. We're looking at chapter 40. Beginning at verse 21, a little higher up than 26. Have you not known? Have you not heard? 
that it has it not been told you from the beginning? Have you not understood it from the foundations of the earth? It is he that sits upon the circle. Note that word. Circle means round. So the earth has been known to be round. Sits upon the circle of the earth. Man, in the early science days, thought that the earth was flat. But if you came to the end, it will fall off. Here the Bible says, the circle of the earth and the inhabitants thereof are as grasshoppers. Wow, is that referred to us? The inhabitants of the earth that stretch out the heavens as a curtain and spread them out as a tent to dwell in. Have you been noticing the tents growing up in California? Looks terrible. That brings the princess to nothing. Princess Diana died an awful death. He makes the judges of the earth as vanity. Yea, they shall not be planted. Yea, they shall not be sown. Yea, their stock shall not take root in the earth. And he shall also blow upon them. And they shall wither. And the whirlwind shall take them away as stubble. To whom then will you liken me? Or shall I be equal, saith the Holy One? Verse 26. Lift up now your eyes on high, and behold who hath created. It's a good word for you. Created? Only God can do that. Created these things that brings out their host by number. He calls them all by names, by the greatness of his might, for that he is strong in power. Not one fails. Why sayest thou, O Jacob, and speakest, O Israel, my way is hid? from the Lord, and my judgment is passed over from my God. So here we see God is clarifying things for us. God is making things clear, clear. So we are not being presumptuous when we ask the question, what is God doing? God made the earth and yes, God made you and me. Are we certain about that? Or did we evolve? Or did it just happen here? God has a plan. And God's plan is being worked out here below. God is seeking, as we get into a second point, to show us that his plan is at work. Hebrews chapter 2. Verse 6. But one in a certain place testified, saying, What is man that thou art mindful of him, or the son of man that you visit him? You made, God made us, that's the point. God made him a little lower than the angels. You crowned him with glory and honor, and it set him over the works of your hands. That's what God told Adam. 
you dress and keep this place. God expects us to keep our surroundings clean. He told him, dress this place and keep it. Verse 8, that was put all things in subjection under his feet. It's not surprising that man can go to man's. God has put all things, as the following lines tell us, not all things yet, under his feet. For he that put all in subjection under him, he left nothing that is not put under him. But now we see Jesus. Now we see not yet all things put under his feet, but we see Jesus, verse 9, who have who is made a little lower than the angels. For the suffering of death, crowned with glory and honor, that he, by the grace of God, should taste death to every man. What has God done? God made the world, the worlds, and God has made man. You know, God made man and he gave him five senses. You hear, you see, you taste, we feel. And God has not only given him five senses, but God has given him five systems. Did you know you have five systems in your, in your body? What are they? Skeletal. We have a skeletal frame. We have a respiratory system, we breathe, inhale and exhale, that's God's work. We have a nervous system, we have a plasmic system, there's one other, that you know what it is, a sexual system which man has sought and is seeking to pervert. He continues, it might be his ruination. So God created all of these systems and all of these senses in us. We are so different from the rest of God's creation in so many ways. But what is God doing? And that's the original question. What is God doing with all of this? If I can submit to you, God is minding. God is maintaining. And God is managing his creation. It's not that God put this orb out here and has turned his back on it. God is maintaining, managing, and minding his creation. And he's doing a good job on it. We're doing a rotten job with all pollution of God's planet. In the scriptures it says, but not the earth. It seems as though man is intent on hurting the earth, bringing about wars and rumors of wars and destruction and every kind of pollution. What is God doing? He's maintaining and managing his creation. Because as we are showing our last point, he has plans for that as well. Matthew 
chapter 6, as a similar to us pointing out, Jesus Christ is the very expression of God. He came to show us whom God is, who God is. And he did a pretty good job of that. Matthew chapter 6, and by the way, you know that that is the similar amount. Chapters 5 and 6 and 7 embody the similar amount. Look at verse 26. See some practical stuff here. Matthew 6, verse 26. <clears throat> Question is, what is God doing? He said he's managing and maintaining and minding the earth that he's created. Look at verse 26. Behold the fowls of the air, for they sow not, neither do they reap, nor gather into bands, yet your heavenly Father feeds them. Are we not much better than they? The birdies get up in the morning, flutter away. What are they going to eat? <laughs> That very morning, the man taking the bread in his early run to the outlets where he delivers, and one loaf falls to the ground. He knows there are too many eyes looking, he couldn't pick that bread up, that loaf, and put it back in the new stack. <laughs> <laughs> the birdies find something to eat for that morning. The young ones are in the nest, their mouths are open, looking up. Till they hear that father or mother flutters and brings something for them to eat. God takes care of the birds. God takes care of the wild beasts in the field. The unicorns, whatever they are, wherever they are. The wild goats on the mountains. God provides for them because God is maintaining, mining, his creation. What is God doing? That's what he's doing. Look at Acts. You can go on further in Matthew, but let's look at Acts. A fantastic chapter. Chapter 17. You have a grasp of the word. We find Paul is on Mars Hill. He's surrounded by skeptics. They start off by saying, <laughs> what is this babbler going to say? What do you have to say? Because they did nothing, these Epicureans sat around all day trying to hear something different and something good. They pushed him forth and said, say something. Paul being an educated man, not being a fool, so some of their artwork displayed different pillars and different signposts. But all right, it said, the God whom you serve, because I saw here one of the markings that said, to the unknown God, him therefore, that you serve ignorantly him. I would like to declare unto you. Let's look at verse 24 of Acts 17. God that made the world, oh, oh God that made the world, it is said in plain English, and all things. Lost my space. I lost my space for a minute, but I found it up. And all things therein, God made all things in the world, seeing that he is Lord of heaven and earth, dwells not in temples made with hands, neither is worshipped with men's hands, as though he needs anything, seeing, on the senses God gives us, seeing he gives to all life, and breath, and all things, and have made of one blood, 
all nations of men for to dwell upon the face of the earth and have determined, this is a very important section of what Paul is saying to these spread out intellectuals, and have determined the times before appointed and the bounds of their habitation. God placed mankind in different places, different peoples come from different parts of the earth, but still the earth. As God's word is concerned, is nobody living out there on Mars, Jupiter, Venus. God has appointed on this orb where different peoples of different kinds will live. He has determined before the bounds of their habitation that they should seek the Lord. That's what God wants man to do. If happily they might feel after him and find him though he be not far from everyone of us. So that God knows where we are. God has placed us here for his purpose and for his plan. He's mining the earth. So God is taking care of his creation. There's another big job God is doing presently. The subject being what is God doing? Minding his creation. Maintaining it. Overseeing it. There's a second point as to what he's doing. God is calling mankind back to himself. God's plan for mankind is being worked out. As Churchill said once, there's a great plan being worked out here below. And God is calling mankind back to himself. But man is, as they say, hard air. He doesn't want to find God. He doesn't want to follow God. He wants to do his own thing in this very Acts 17. Let's continue from verse 28, all into 30 and all. But it spreads out here very clearly. For in him we live, move, and have our being. As certain also of your own poets have said, for we also are his offspring. God created us. We are the offspring of God. Verse 29. For as much then as we are the offspring of God, we ought not to think that the Godhead is like unto gold or silver or stone or graven by the arts and of man's devices. Verse 30. And the times of this ignorance God winked at. God knew that scientists were ignorant people. They thought that God was made of stone, of gold, precious stone. But now commands all men everywhere, all men, all the inhabitants of the earth at any one time to repent. What is God doing? He's overseeing his population, his creation, and he's commanding all men everywhere to repent. That includes you, my brother. God wants you to repent of your sin. He'll tell you why in a couple of lines. God wants you to come to him, your creator, and follow. Verse 31 says, because, because he has appointed a day in the which he will judge the world. Ah, oh, the world is not done yet. Eh? God will judge the world in righteousness. You couldn't come to God and say, well, I'm a sinner, but you know, you got to have mercy upon me. Uh, I, I didn't know what your plan was. He will judge the world in righteousness by that man whom he has ordained. Who could that be? We all, he has given assurance unto all men 
in that he has raised him from the dead. That's only Jesus Christ. God's testament, God's evidence of his plan for mankind in calling them back to himself is declared in the sacrifice of his son, Jesus Christ, for the redemption of all mankind. Read another verse. And when they heard of the resurrection of the dead, the Epicureans and these people who just wanted to shoot the breeze, when they heard the depth of his articulation, some mocked, and others said, ha, 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 we'll hear you again of this matter. Divergence in response to what the great apostle Paul had said. So God is not only minding his creation, God is now calling it his creation back to himself. And we're here this morning as a testimony that God is calling us. God wants us to obey him, to do his will. And thus carry out his purpose. Verse 33. So Paul departed from among them, albeit certain men clave unto him and believed among the which was Dinophrotus, the Arapagite, and a woman named Demetrius, and others with them. In other words, there were others who wanted to hear more about what this man was talking about. So they lingered to hear what else he had to say. So, what is God doing? Well, the question is, has he ever done anything? He established he created the world. He created you and me. What is he doing now? I couldn't tell you what he's doing this very minute. But I know his overall plan and purpose is to maintain his creation. And he's calling men and women unto himself to respond to his plan of redemption for all mankind. One other point. What will God do? Where was God when his son was crucified? Why did they stop that cruelty? Where was God when the Twin Towers fell? You had family and friends in that building. There was a young woman from our congregation who worked down there. And she heard the cry, don't leave, stay. She said she put her shoes on and ran down as fast as she could out of that building. As a consequence, as far as we know, she's still alive today. She visits here with us from time to time. So, where was God when your loved one died? You thought he was merciless. How could that happen? Where was God when his son Jesus Christ died and gave his life, as the word said, as a propitiation for our sins? God saw that. And he went through with the plan because this was the only way mankind could be brought back to God, not the sacrifice of a goat or a pigeon or a dove or a lamb, except the sacrifice of the very Lamb of God. So, God saw all of that. And you say, what is God doing? Is he seeing what's happening in our world? Is he seeing the cruelty and the, the mayhem that man is doing to his universe? Well, God will do something. Let's take a look at what God will do. God's plan is that he will Eventually, in his own time, we can't force the hand of God. 
Big Ten team, God, I need help right now. God is developing in us character. God is developing his plan. And he knows that there are several others out there who need to be called but to come to the understanding of his plan and his will. God will establish his kingdom on the earth. The other churches teach that we're going to go to heaven. That has never been the teaching of the word of God. God's word teaches us that God's kingdom will be established on the earth. Look at Revelation. Look at the last book of the Bible. Chapter 5. Look at verses 9 and 10 and see if this makes sense. God will reign on the earth, not on Mars or Pluto or Venus or any of the other. God's occupation, God's attention is riveted on the earth. That's where he placed Adam and Eve, on the earth. Revelation chapter 5, verses 9 and 10. And they sang a new song saying, You are worthy to take the book and to open the seals thereof. For you who slain, Jesus Christ was slain for all sins, all the other religious leaders of the world who follow whoever they follow, we know that their leader was not slain for them. He was slain and has redeemed us to God by your blood out of every kindred and tongue and people and nation. Let's hasten to verse 10. And has made on us unto our God kings and priests and we, let's read this slow, and we shall reign on the earth. That's what I said. God's plan is that Christ and God the Father will reign on the earth. What God will do, God will reign on the earth. We're ready in Revelation. <clears throat> we are ready in Revelation. Look at verse uh, chapter 21. Get started with verse 1. John, the revelator, the one to whom these visions and these prophecies and predictions were given. Chapter 21 and verse 1. John on the Isle of Patmos says, And I saw a new heaven and a new earth. For the first heaven and the first earth were passed away, and there was no more sea. And I, John, saw the holy city, New Jerusalem, coming down from God out of heaven. That's going to be a confusion that day. God and his holy city is coming down, but everybody else wants to go up. There's going to be some major clash somewhere between earth and the heavens. He's coming down from God, out of heaven, prepared as a bride adorned for her husband. And I heard a great voice out of heaven saying, Behold, the tabernacle, or the dwelling place of God, is with men. And he will dwell with them. And they shall be his people. And God himself, not another, God himself shall be with them. And be their God. And God shall wipe away all tears from the eyes. We are at the point of what God will do. And there shall be no more death. That's going to be a great day. 
neither sorrow nor crying, neither shall there be any more pain, for the former things are passed away. And he that sat upon the throne said, Behold, I make all things new. And he said unto me, Write, for these words are true and faithful. We can go on. And he said unto me, It is done. I am Alpha and Omega, the beginning and the end. And I will give unto him that is the thirst of the fountain of the water of life free. He that overcomes shall inherit all things, and I will be his God, and he shall be my son. What God will do? God will dwell on earth with us. Look at Matthew, the further ratification. Matthew 5, back in the Beatitudes or back in the Seven and the Mount, chapter 5. Look at verse 3. Blessed are the poor in spirit, for theirs is the kingdom of heaven. Kingdom of heaven and kingdom of God are used interchangeably. Blessed, said verse 4, are they that mourn, for they shall be comforted. Blessed are the meek, very important verse, for they shall inherit heaven, or Mars, or Pluto, or Venus, maybe Jupiter. No, they shall inherit the earth. As verse 8 says, Blessed are the pure in heart, for they shall see God. Remember the sermonet? People saw God. And Christ sitting here on the mount says, Blessed are the pure in heart, for they shall see God. Mm -hmm. Look in the Old Testament. Look at Isaiah, chapter 35, which gives us uh, quite an exposure as to what God's dwelling on the earth will be like with mankind. Chapter 35, you know what that says? You're looking at a restored, refreshed earth. The wilderness and the solitary place shall be glad for them, and the desert shall rejoice and blossom as a rose. Our deserts today are in terrible shape. That's what man has done to them. He shall blossom abundantly and rejoice even with joy and singing. The glory of Lebanon shall be given unto it. The excellency of Carmel and Shire they shall see the glory of the Lord, of the eternal, and the excellency of our God. Strengthen ye the weak hands and confirm the feeble knees. Say to them that are of a fearful heart, be strong, fear not. Behold, your God will come with vengeance. Christ came as a babe in a manger one time. As he's come with vengeance, even God, with a recompense or payment, he will come and save you. Then the eyes of the blind shall be opened and the ears of the deaf shall be unstopped. Verse 6, 
Then shall the lame man leap as an heart, rejoicing, jubilation. As Christ and God did, will have come back to the earth and set their kingdom up, shall leap like a heart, and the tongue of the dumb sing. For in the wilderness shall waters break out, and streams in the desert, and the parched ground shall become a pool, and the thirsty land springs of water in the habitation of dragons. Are there still dragons on here? You have the Kamuru dragon and the other certain time like creatures that dwell on the earth. They each lay shall be grass with weed grass in the desert. That sounds like restoration to me. Reeds and bulrushes, verse 8, and a highway shall be there and a way, and it shall be called the way of holiness. The unclean shall not pass over it. We got to get cleaned up if you're going to be there. But it shall be for those, the wayfaring men, though fools who have been redeemed shall not err therein. No lion shall be there, nor any ravenous beast shall go up thereon. It shall not be round found there. But the redeemed, here's that word again, the redeemed. Redeem means brought back. The redeemed shall walk there. And the ransom, same kind of word of the Lord, shall return and come to Zion with singing and everlasting joy upon their heads. They shall obtain joy and gladness and sorrow and sighing shall flee away. What God will do? God will come back to the earth to reign with men. Reference was made earlier with Zacharias. Let's look at Zacharias. I didn't want Malachi. Let's look at Zechariah chapter 14. Talking about what God will do. <coughs> Start at verse 9. Zechariah 14. Verse 9. We looked at what God has done. We looked at what God is doing. Maintaining his creation. Calling mankind back to himself. And our last point is what God will do. Zechariah 14, beginning of verse 9, tells us, And the Lord shall be king over all the earth. He will not stand for disobedience. Those who want to get there and feel, okay, we usually worship on Sunday. None of that here. He'll be king over all the earth in that day shall there be one Lord and his name one. All the land shall be turned as a plain, flat, to Gibeah, to Ramon, south of Jerusalem. We're talking about terra firma, where we dwell. God will dwell. The names of these places are known to us, particularly Jerusalem. And it shall be lifted up and inhabited in high in her place. From Benjamin's gate that exists in Palestine today in Israel, even unto the place of the first gate, under the corner gate, and from the tower of Hanel unto the king's winepress. Verse 11. And men shall dwell in it. This habitation of God and the earth, men shall dwell in it, redeemed men, of course. There shall be no more utter destruction, but Jerusalem shall be safely inhabited. Have you thought that we're going to live in Jerusalem one day on the earth? After Christ is coming back to put his headquarters, leave some more verses. And this shall be the plague 
wherewith the eternal will smite all the people that have fought against Jerusalem. Talk about the battle of Armageddon. Those who fight against him, their flesh can consume away while they stand upon their feet, and their eyes shall consume away in their holes, and their tongue shall consume away in their mouth. God is meaning business when it comes back. There's going to be no opposition. You don't get people together and say, what well, God is doing, we don't like, let's go up against him. God is coming back to reign on the earth. Let's look at verse 16. A little further ahead here. And it shall come to pass that everyone that is left of all the nations which came against Jerusalem shall even go up from year to year <laughs> to do what? To worship the king, the Lord of hosts, and to keep the feast of tabernacles. It's not going to be done away. It's going to be reestablished in the kingdom of God. And it shall be that whosoever will not come up of all the families of the earth unto Jerusalem to worship the king, the Lord of hosts, even upon them shall be no rain. God is in charge of the rain, and he can send rain on the just and the unjust, but he withholds rain. And if the family of Egypt, in other words, if the Egyptians say, well, we want to stay with our gods and our tombs and our bones, fail to go up and come not, that have no, that have no rain, there shall be the plague wherewith the eternal will smite the heathen that come not up to keep the feast of tabernacles. So we see that in the kingdom of God, the feast of God will still be practiced. This shall be the punishment of Egypt and the punishment of all nations that come not up to keep the feast of tabernacles. What God has done, created you and me. What God is doing, he's maintaining and minding his creation and he's calling men to be unto himself. <laughs> and finally, what God will do, God will establish his kingdom here on earth and will reign and there will be no nation that can come up opposition to him because there's going to be one king one Lord, and he shall be the controller of what happens here on the earth.